Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks for joining us for our talk today on Martha Stevens and her daughter, Carolyn Bayard Stevens, and the celebration of their lives and accomplishments. My name is Eileen Lynn. I work here at the. I didn't even put it there. I don't even know her. And I'm going to talk about Martha and Caroline. This is our New Jersey Women Make History. And I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, which is the New Jersey Council on the Humanities, who sponsored this uh, series. And that's why we're able to offer it to you for free. I'd also like to thank the New Jersey Historical Commission who support the museum with general operating support grants that allows us to pay basic expenses. I hope that next week you will join us for our talk on Hoboken born artist, Anne Ryan. Anne Ryan is one of the most important artists that Hoboken has produced and yet no one has heard of her. Uh, her work is in the collections of the Met, MoMA and the Smithsonian. Our speaker is going to be the artist, Nancy Nicole. She has done a lot of work on Anne's family who it turns out were a pretty high profile Hoboken family. Um, and she's going also going to discuss Anne's art. So in addition to Alfred Stieglitz, Dorothea Lang and Frank Sinatra, I hope we can start including Anne Ryan to that list because I think you'll agree after next week's talk that she deserves to be on that list. This talk will be here. Nancy Nicole will be here in the museum and she will, it'll be streamed live on Zoom. Um, I'd like to thank Leah Luskatov, who's the head of archives and special collections at Stevens Institute of Technology, because she shared a lot of her research on Caroline Stevens with me. Now, before we go on to talk about Martha and Caroline's lives and achievements, I'd like to point out that there's hardly anything left of Martha and Caroline. Um, that is to say, there are no diaries, letters, invoices, notes, nothing. There's hardly any photographs of them. Um, the museum has one card that is in Caroline's hand, and I'll show that to you later. It's not very illuminating, but it is in her hand. Um, we don't know what happened to their papers. It's possible somebody just didn't think much of them and threw them out. Um, it's possible maybe that Caroline and Martha themselves said, oh, I want my papers destroyed. Um, maybe Martha and Caroline didn't think what they were doing was so important and didn't see any need to archive their papers. Um, I have a feeling somebody just threw them out. Um, it is very sad, and this is kind of the story, this is sort of emblematic of history in general. Um, history really is the story of only one half. Um, of society because so much of women's stuff was left out or thrown out. Um, what I've done today is put, tried to put Caroline's story together through what was in the newspapers. So I used a lot of New York Times and Jersey Journal archival materials. So here's our ladies. I'm going to do a quick background on the four generations of Stevens families because we've heard a lot about them, most of us who come to lectures at the museum. Um, they were a family that burned with ingenuity, imagination and intelligence. Well, I mean, we know the men burned with all those things. We don't know much about the women because uh, we don't know much about the women in the Stevens family, period. We know who they married, we know who their children were, but beyond that, we don't know much. So I'm gonna start by quickly going through the Stevens family tree. Um, these are the original Stevens, that's the OG up there, John Stevens, he's the one who came over from Britain. Um, he was an indentured servant, which meant he was uh, hired, really paid, his passage was paid, and he agreed to work for a lawyer who was uh, working, for the, working for the English government. And he married very well. She was, came from a family that owned a lot of land. And then there's his son, who was also a great guy. Um, he was a member of the Continental Congress. He ratified the constitution on behalf of New Jersey. He was the first treasurer. Um, he was, that, that meant he, he traveled long distances in New Jersey as the treasurer carrying money to Washington's armies. Um, and that meant he had a lot of time to think about better ways to travel long distances than horseback. Um, now his son, and this is, this, when we think of the Stevens family, that's kind of who we think of. Um, Colonel John Stevens 
Alt took over his father's position as state treasurer. He served from 1776 to 1783. He became known as the treasurer on horseback. Um, this is the, Colonel John is the one who created um, Hoboken as we know it, um, because he was a Revolutionary War hero. He uh, was able to purchase at auction the land that is Stevens, um, and he bought it from land that had been confiscated from William Bayard. Um, and it was confiscated from him because he sided with the Tories. Um, he married Rachel Cox Stevens and she came from a big uh, land holding family around New Brunswick. Um, they had 13 children. Um, this is the Stevens who built the first steamboat, invented the railroad, set up the first commercial commuter ferry boat service, many, many, many other things. That guy up there was a genius. Um, one of their sons, John Cox Stevens, he was the sporty Stevens. He um, stayed on the water, designed yachts, uh, founded the New York Yacht Club, established the America's Club. Robert and Edwin, these are just three of them, there were 13. Edwin and Robert were really also like their father, big engineers. And uh, Edwin also um, had a head for, for business and finance. Um, they were all very generous to the community. Um, and Edwin, of course, is the Stevens who left the land and money for the school uh, that became Stevens Institute of Technology. Martha's parents, uh, that's her father, Albert Baldwin Dodd, and her mother was Carolyn Smith Bayard. Um, now, uh, her father was a theologian and a mathematician. In fact, he was a professor at the Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, her maternal grandfather was Samuel Bayard, who was a relative of William Bayard, who Hoboken was confiscated from him. Um, the Bayards were originally French, probably French Huguenots. They immigrated to the Netherlands at some point, and Martha's maternal line can be traced back to Peter Stuyvesant. Martha was the eldest of three brothers and four sisters. All her brothers served in the Civil War, and one of her brothers, Charles, lost his life. Again, Martha did not come from a wealthy family. She came from a very well-respected family, um, but again, they all married well, and two of her sisters married into the politically powerful Stockton family. Um, in 1845, Martha's father dies. She's 14, and the eldest, the youngest, was two years old. While her father's position as a professor was probably well-respected, um, I wouldn't imagine they had a lot of money, so they may have struggled, they may have depended, I mean, you have eight kids and your husband died, and it's, you know, 1845. Um, there's no social security. Um, I'm gonna imagine that they struggled financially and the family probably experienced some difficult financial years. Now her father's early death may explain why Martha was working as a housekeeper when she met Edwin Stevens. Um, this is not her around this time. This is probably her a little bit older, but I like this photo of her with her little white blouse and she looks so modest. Um, um, I don't know. Um, she, uh, so she's working as a housekeeper. She's 23. And this is probably out around Princeton. And I would imagine that if Martha was a housekeeper at 23, she probably was very mature um, and a very sensible woman. Uh, housekeepers had a lot of responsibility back then. You had to be a bookkeeper. You had to supervise the staff. You had to do quality control. Um, you had to manage a budget. Um, so I would imagine she was good at those things. And at 23, she probably was, you know, pretty mature. Um, how her and Edwin met, I don't know. I'm going to guess he came to the house maybe that she was working in. Um, but however they met, uh, you know, it's interesting because at this point when Edwin meets Martha, he has been a widow for 12 years. Um, and it's hard to imagine that there weren't some Fifth Avenue society matriarchs who would have liked to have set up their daughter, their granddaughter, their niece with the powerful wealthy Stevens. So how he managed to resist that, I'm not really sure. Uh, but, you know, in those days, wealthy, just like today, wealthy and powerful people want to marry each other. They want to keep that wealth and power consolidated in the family. Um, 
that wasn't the case with Edwin and Martha. They were on different terms there. Um, so he'd been a widower for 12 years. Um, Martha must have struck him as a little different from most of the other women in his life. Um, she came from modest background. Her father was an academic. He wasn't a Gilded Age millionaire. She worked, she had a job, it was even a profession. Um, maybe, that's what, maybe that's what Edwin liked about her. Um, but in addition to the differences in their um, backgrounds, there was also a huge age difference. Um, he was 36 years older than her. She was 23, he was 58. Um, so despite their 36 year age difference, they marry in 19, that's, this is probably what Edwin looked like um, around the time that they met. Um, in spite of the 36 year age difference, they quickly had eight children, John, Edwin, Caroline, Julia, two Roberts, Charles and Richard. Only six lived to adulthood. The eldest, uh, the oldest Robert only lived one year. And in eight, this was, uh, it, they married in 1854. Um, in 1870, this is two years after Edwin's death. Edwin died in 1868. In 1870, while on a family trip to Europe, when the family was in Rome, the six-year-old daughter, Julia, the youngest daughter, developed typhoid fever and died. The family um, immediately came back to Hoboken and Julia was eventually buried in the Stevens family plot in Hoboken Cemetery in North Bergen. Julia's death was a huge earth shattering event in the Stevens family um, for everyone. And Martha would later channel her grief into the creation of Holy Innocence Church. But at Edwin's death in, at the age of 73, Martha is only 37. And her seven children range in ages from 12-year-old John Stevens, the fourth, to Richard Stevens, who was only three months old. Um, so in a way, Martha is left like her mother, a young widow with a bunch of kids. Big difference is she's got money. Edwin left everything to her. Um, and this included the land that Stevens Institute was built on and um, money to build it. Uh, I just is just gonna show you, this is a um, Stephen's house, Stephen's castle, as they called it. There's another shot of it. Um, and so, uh, so he's left this money to build the school, a school of higher learning. That's all the instruction in his will said, and he left money for it. It was really Martha who said, it should be a school for the mechanical arts. And she wanted to celebrate her family's legacy. So we have her to thank for that. Um, at the same time that she was doing this, this took place around, you know, right after he died, they probably started working on it in 1869 or so. It opened in 1870. Um, but around the same time, she was also planning uh, Holy Innocence um, and raising two children. Um, the church that Martha built, Holy Innocence here, um, she built this as a tribute to her daughter. It was built as a free church. Um, so there's a picture of it, uh, built as a free church. It didn't have pew fees, so they didn't have to pay. It welcomed the city's poor who otherwise wouldn't have been able to attend such a beautiful church. Um, even where the church was built at 6th and Willow, between Willow and Clinton there, um, in 1905, that was referred to by the Jersey Journal as the factory and tenement district. I would say in 1871, it was not a nice area at all. It probably didn't even have paved roads. It was very wet. And it's interesting. I mean, they really, you know, the Stevens, they didn't just talk it, they walked it. Um, they used that church. It wasn't a church they built and then never went to. It was their family church. Um, to create the design, she chose the architects, Edward Tuckerman Potter. He's known for the Mark Twain house in, ha in Hartford and many churches in Hartford as well. And his partner, Henry Vaughn, who worked on the Washington National Cathedral as well as St. John the Divine in Manhattan. Um, these, were not her, these were not her first lar they called large construction projects. Um, in the early 1860s, um, based on an idea uh, 
inspired by housing that she had seen in Scotland, workers' housing, she uh, set about uh, designing and building the Willow Terrace houses. That's, I couldn't find any historic photos of Willow Terrace. That's a contemporary photo of, William, of uh, Willow Terrace. Um, and these houses were built, um, little, little tiny workers' cottages, still there today. And they were built for mainly the workers of the Stevens estate and also the Hoboken Land and Improvement Company, which was the Stevens real estate holding company, I guess, and an investment company. Um, and these were for the workers who, who lived along the Western, less populated uh, area of town, and they lived in shanties and tents before this. Now, 10 years after the Willow Terrace houses were built, um, another project that was an example of Martha's interest in improving the living conditions of the poor was what was then known as the Odenheimer House. This was... Um, built across the street from Holy Innocence. This is at 6th and Clinton. Um, these were built in 1875. They were built as state-of-the-art model tenements. The building is described in an 1881 evening journal, the evening edition of the Jersey Journal, article on Hoboken's lowlands. This is what they said about the building. The first prominent building near the swamps is the tenement house owned by the Hoboken Land and Improvement Company on Clinton and 6th Streets. It is a large five-story brick building in the monastic style having Venetian blinds. The staircase leading to the upper floors is in an open quadrangle in the middle of the house lighted from the roof. About 50 families have airy and comfortable apartments here. On all sides of the house, there are fire escapes and a flat roof makes a pleasant place to promenade or retire on warm evenings. So it sounds nice. It was right across the street from Holy Innocence Church. So again, they really, they really did that right. Um, Martha was also responsible for the establishment of the Hoboken Free Public Library and the Manual Training School. There's the entrance to the Manual Training School in the middle there, a very familiar site to most Hobokeners. And the Manual Training School um, provided a vocational education to Hoboken's poorest kids. It opened in 1897. Um, by the way, the Hoboken Public Library was the third, only the third library in New Jersey to open. Um, in 1895, Martha arranged for the Sisters of the Poor of St. Francis, um, uh, who operated St. Mary's Hospital, to enlarge the hospital by having the Hoboken Land and Improvement Company, who owned the mortgage on the land, cancel the debt. And this allowed the sisters to build um, an extension, another ward, which they named their St. Mary's, which they named St. Martha's Ward. Um, again, St. Mary's was the second hospital um, in the state of New Jersey to open. Um, the Martha Institute, I'll show you that, there it is, uh, provided vocational training for young men at Park Avenue and 6th. Um, I'm sort of banging on to the end here. Um, Martha dies at 68, April 2nd, 1899. And the New York Times noted that she was one of the wealthiest women in America at the time that she died. Um, I'm going to talk about Carolyn a little bit, and Martha will come up a little bit in that too. There's Martha's bedroom. It's Martha's bedroom. That's a photo taken from the year she died, 1899. Um, there's a lot of photographs of the interior of uh, Stevens Castle online, if you want to look at them. So this is Carolyn Bayard Stevens at around 1875. She would be 16. She was Martha and Edwin's oldest daughter. Um, she was nine when her father died and 11 when her sister died. I don't really know a lot about her childhood because we don't have anything on them. Um, her brothers and most of the Stevens males were all educated at St. Paul's School in New Hampshire and then most of them went on to Columbia. Um, I'm gonna guess she was educated by tutors. She was certainly intelligent. Um, she married for the first time to a man named Archibald Alexander. He was a philosophy professor um, at Columbia. Uh, just, oop, there's the house again where they lived. Okay, so there's Miss Carrie Stevens and husband, Professor Archibald Alexander. Um, 
They married in 1879. She was 20. They had one child about a year later, a son also named Archibald Alexander. Um, this is a report in the New York Times on her honeymoon departure. And I want to read a little bit of it to you because it really kind of captures the times and it presents, it presents Caroline in sort of a youthful light, which we don't see that much of. Uh, early yesterday morning, the Inman steamship City of Richmond was boarded by a crowd of elegantly dressed ladies and gentlemen who had come to pay their respects to Professor Archibald Alexander and his bride, formerly Miss Carrie Stevens of Hoboken. I've never seen her referred to as Carrie before. The saloon tables were crowded with floral designs of every description addressed to the bride and groom, two state rooms on the starboard side, forward of the saloon and the first officer's room, which had been engaged for the bridal party, were decorated with lace curtains and flowers. Representatives of nearly all of the first families of New York and vicinity were present to bid farewell to the professor and his bride, blah, blah, blah. But you see what I'm saying? That was kind of gilded age, partiness. Um, and it's 1897. So it is kind of the perfect time for it. Um, I'll just say this about her husband, Archibald Alexander. Um, he probably looked really good on paper. Um, his grandfather, also Archibald Alexander, was a famous theologian and the founder of Princeton Seminary. It's very possible, in fact, likely that Archibald Alexander's grandfather and Carolyn's grandfather knew each other. They were both theologians at a Princeton seminary. Um, but it's really, it's a little hard to know how long the marriage lasted. They were divorced in 1895. Uh, the family story seems to be that he disappeared to Europe. Um, Martha is alive at this point. If they divorced in 1895, Martha is alive. And for a family as religious as the Stevens were, and as, as much as they had invested in being seen as morally upright, I can imagine that Caroline's divorce was a big problem, as a, was a big thing. I mean, I don't, think, I don't think there's another Stevens who's ever been divorced. I mean, it was a big deal to get divorced in 1897, as it is. Um, what the problem was, why this marriage didn't work out, I don't know. But whatever it was, it was an insurmountable problem. Um, it looks, and it, 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 she, he's kind of erased from the books. Um, and he seems to never have really had any contact with her or his son. He had a son at this point. Um, whatever their reasons were, it was definitely something that both, saw, both her side of the family and his side of the family had had agreed this was what we were gonna do. Um, we can only speculate on what the problem was. A divorce at this level in society was just earth shattering. Um, and definitely the reason they split up was not something anybody wanted made public. So um, Carolyn definitely, uh, took her mother's example of civil service uh, to heart and along with the kind of volunteer work that, that many um, young women of her stature would do back then. They would go to parties, um, you know, for raise money for the foundling hospital and feed the poor and lots of party events and fundraising events. Um, this is an example of a fundraising event that took place up at Stevens Castle um, it's a tableau vivant for charity. I'm sorry, forgive my terrible French accent. Um, basically, tableau vivant means living, living painting. So what they would do for charity, this was kind of a trend for a few decades among wealthy people. What they would do is they would dress up like a famous painting um, and they would set the scene of the painting and then they would stand there. <laughs> And party guests would walk by and they would go, <gasps> um, and that's what it was. And, and I'll, I'll just, I'll tell you who hosted this. There's sort of a surprise important guest here. Hang on. Um, okay. Uh, Castle Point, the home of Mrs. Edwin A. Stevens, famous for the many charity entertainments that have been given there was the scene yesterday of an interesting series of tableau vivants arranged by 
Mrs. Stevens, that would be Martha, Mrs. A. Alexander, that's Caroline, and W. M. Chase, the artist, for the benefit of St. Catherine's Home. St. Catherine's Home was a home for unwed girls and their babies in Jersey City. Um, the pictures were presented in the Great Hallway of the Mansion. Uh, the audience of 300 was placed in the rotunda. Um, Next came a picture suggested by Chaplin's The Golden Age presented by Miss Stevens. The audience showed its appreciation of this picture by rapturous applause. Um, I just want you to note that the, the, the hosts of this were Martha Stevens, Carolyn Stevens, and the artist W.M. Chase. That's William Merritt Chase. So he was pals with them and that's the kind of things that they did. Um, now here's another one. Now this is a little controversial, but I'm sorry it has to be faced. Um, it's kind of been accepted that the first open air presentation of a Shakespeare play happened at Stevens, happened at Stevens Castle. And here it is, there's, we're reading about it right here, a play in the open air, as you like it to be acted on a lawn at Castle Point. Um, pastoral plays, have been of such rare occurrence in this country and Mrs. Alexander and the other ladies made arrangements for this one. Um, the thing is, they, they, did, they did two performances, one in April and one in June. This was a performance with uh, Maurice Barrymore. Um, and gee, I don't have the other, I would read it to you, but they describe the, um, they describe the setting. It was, it was just a wonderful setting for a play. But further on in the article, they tell you that um, they got the idea from a, a production that had been done about a year earlier um, in Massachusetts. So sorry, I hate to rain on Hope Hogan's parade. But um, however, Carolyn did a lot more things as she got older. Um, she got very deeply committed to social work. Um, she was a member of many women's clubs and this was the heyday of women's clubs. Women, especially middle and upper class women, they didn't have a lot of outlets for their intelligence or their creativity, they came together and they formed clubs on, you know, all kinds of topics, books, social issues of the day, politics, civic affairs, um, so they could educate themselves and, you know, sort of talk about how they can help tackle social issues. Um, this is a directory from 1911. This directory uh, was a directory of all the charitable, you can see, educational, civic, charitable churches and religious congregations. This directory was um, uh, funded by the Robert L. Stevens Municipal Foundation for Research or something like that. Um, yeah, the Robert Stevens Foundation for Municipal Research. So this contained all the social service agencies, all the officers, who, who all the officers were and what their money was spent on. Um, and they call it a who's who of Hoboken's uplift work, which is kind of interesting. Um, so these are all the organizations that, Hobo that Caroline was presiding over in 1911. Um, and I'm gonna go through some of them with you because some of these organizations um, had really been around for quite a while. One of them was called the Helping Hand Club and that had been founded by Martha in 1865. There was a widow's home it was at 1815 Bloomfield. It was founded in 1838 with money left by Rachel Cox Stevens in her will. Um, as far as I know, this uh, home was there until 1912. Um, and it was for widows over 65 years of age who were members of the Episcopal Church. Um, the United Aid Society and the Society for the Prevention of, of Cruelty to Children. These were really important uh, organizations to Carolyn. Um, they, the United Aid Society operated an orphanage at 502 Bloomfield. It was founded in 1906. It was just meant to be a temporary home for children so they, they could be permanently placed. They also managed the Mary Stevens Hammond home 
on Park Avenue. Um, there was a Memorial Day nursery. This was for poor working women. It was a 220 Willow. And Stevens, uh, Richard Stevens, Caroline's brother, he funded a milk depot there as well. It was to provide milk for infants and to instruct mothers in the proper care of babies. There was the Industrial Society at 220 Willow. This was organized in 1883, so that went pretty far back. Uh, that was to provide working girls with means for self-improvement and opportunities for social intercourse. Educational opportunities were provided by classes in music, embroidery, dressmaking, and cooking. Um, there was the National Plant Flower and Fruit Club. This was to carry brightness into the lives of the poor and the sick of our great cities and to minister to their comfort. The Needlework Guild. This is interesting. The Needlework Guild doesn't do what you think it would do. The Needlework Guild's purpose was to collect and distribute new, plain, suitable garments to meet the needs of hospitals, homes, and other charities. Membership was open to men, women, and children, and the, contribute, the annual contribution was two or more garments of wearing apparel, household linen, or a small money donation. So you could, a, a child could donate clothing and that would be you know something that they would do for for you know the poor people uh the industrial education this was at 506 park train women and girls in domestic economy um now many of these clubs and organizations were staffed by women volunteers and as i said women's clubs were very big at the time so this would be the kind of thing that they would do um, I know that women's club sounds very genteel, but they were actually very powerful um, in 1896, and Carolyn was a big part of this. Um, women's clubs came together and they formed the New Jersey Federation, uh, the New Jersey State Federation of Women's Clubs, and they had two goals. One was for the preservation of the Palisades and to protect them from commercial exploit, uh, exploitation, and the other was the establishment of a public college for women. And they did both those things. And you know, this was before women could even vote. So while Carolyn, I just put up this picture of her. This is from her about 1908. Like I said, there's not a lot of photos of either of these women. So um, I'm just gonna say Carolyn supported vote, votes for women, of course. And she did it kind of quietly. She didn't march in any parades or do anything radical. Um, but in 1912, she joined a number of society women, including her daughter-in-law, um, who worked on behalf of women's suffrage. Um, Caroline's son, who was an aide to President Wilson, um, also supported votes for women and helped his mother organize the Women's National Wilson and Marshall Association under the Democratic National Committee banner. Um, in this article, let me show you, this is this is the headline from the article I'm going to quote. This was in the Trenton Times, September 6, 1915. Carolyn is asked why she supports women's suffrage and I wanna read you a bit of her reply. A sense of justice and common sense. At the same time, experience has strengthened my convictions. The history of legislative proposals in New Jersey led me to see that in matters of vital importance to the health and moral conditions of the community, that there are two points of view, men's and women's. For instance, when we made great efforts to raise the age of consent from 16 to 18, we found ourselves up against a stone wall. The Senate, composed of men, could only see the possibility of blackmail while the women considered only the need for further protection of our girls between the ages of 16 and 18. In this case, the man's point of view prevailed because they alone have the power to elect representatives. I think our girl was a feminist. I am going, I'm just gonna go out there on a limb and say that. And I'm also gonna say that the age of consent in New Jersey is 16. Um, unfortunately, during this, around this period, um, Caroline's son died. He dies in 1912, I think he's about 32. He dies from typhoid poisoning, um, typhoid fever. Um, at the time of his death, he was running uh, for a, a New Jersey congressional seat as a Democrat. Um, his funeral was of course held at Holy Innocence and was attended by Governor Wilson who was running for president at the time. Now, since Caroline's divorce, She's been 
unmarried anyway. Um, I don't think she was exactly single. Here's our romantic hero. I developed a little crush on Otto Whitpin as I was doing this. Um, she had been involved, she does eventually marry Otto as she'd been, probably been involved with him for years before they married. Um, Otto Whitpin was born in Jersey City. He served as the mayor um, for three consecutive terms. Here he, here he is, maybe around the time he was mayor. Um, he was also a successful banker. He was a naval officer. He was the president of the First National Bank of Hoboken, and he was the president of the Hoboken Land and Improvement Company. Very well-known figure in New York and New Jersey political circles. Um, also a social reformer, um, him and Caroline, very much in tune on their values. Um, so they marry in 1915, and their marriage was announced um, on the cover of the front page of the New York Times, right smack in the middle of the page, which I think bespeaks to uh, the kind of power um, and, and sort of fame that they had at the time. Um, they married in 1915, it was announced on the front page of the time. I think Caroline and Otto were a bit of a power couple. And I think the placement of this right smack in the middle of the front page of the New York Times sort of bespeaks to that. Um, now, I want to talk about this headline a little bit. It says, Mrs. Alexander to wed H. O. Whitpin, late Colonel Edwin A. Stevens' eldest daughter to marry a naval officer of port today. Divorced husband missing. But bride-to-be, high church Episcopalian, waited 20 years to satisfy herself of his death. Wow, I've seen the pictures of Otto. That had to be hard. Um, well, I just want to unpack this a little bit because divorced husband missing makes me want to ask, did you look under the bed? Um, because um, this is wonderful and romantic and I'm happy for Caroline and Otto. However, that missing husband, she waited 20 years to satisfy herself of his death. Guess what? Wasn't dead. In fact, he was so alive, he wrote a letter to the editor of the New York Times in response to this wedding announcement. And I'm gonna read it because it's kind of funny and it might clue you in a little bit why this marriage didn't work. Um, to the editor of the New York Times, I have read with interest in several American newspapers, uh, news of my death, of my own death. While the matter is not very important to anyone except myself, I take this excellent means of announcing, not without diffidence, that I am alive and well. <laughs> Doubtless to lighten the blow, some of the reports say that I have, quote, disappeared. The term is ambiguous, but it is generally thought that to disappear is even more disgraceful than to die. It is a term predicated of absconders, suicides, and tyrants. Not being ubiquitous, I cannot easily appear in any one time in, any, in more than one place. Nevertheless, I have done what I could, and during my absence of eight years from New York, I have appeared to a number of European communities successfully and am even now appearing at Geneva, my place of residence, Archibald Alexander, January 21st, 1915, adding insult to injury, that letter was published on Valentine's Day. Um, so, ouch. Um, now, Caroline and Otto, I really do think they were kind of a power couple and they were in the thick of New Jersey politics. Um, they were referred to in an article in 1929 when Otto was appointed, whoops. Oh, I guess I don't have that one. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Not, not important. Otto was, uh, you can leave it on Alexander. Otto was appointed to the State Highway Commission by New Jersey then Governor Larson. Um, and he is referred to in this article as an anti-Haig Democrat. Okay, so this was, these was the years of Frank Haig's domination of, the, of being the mayor of Jersey City and he just had, he had so much power in state politics as well. The previous governor was Harry Moore who was Haig's governor. I mean, he just did everything Haig told him to do. And one of the things he did was he did not reappoint Caroline to what was, I guess, a pretty important board. It was called the State Board of Control of Agencies and Institutions. 
So in the article where he's being appointed um, to the state, the state highway commission, in this same article, Carolyn is also identified as an anti-democrat, uh, anti-Hag Democrat. And um, he states that he is going to increase the number of seats on this board so that she can be put back on the board. Um, this board um, was a was a later incarnation of a board called the New Jersey State Guardianship or Council of Guardians of which Caroline had been on and she had been very effective. So I think that's why people wanted her on there. Um, however, it sounds like petty politics and it is, um, but in 1937, five years after Caroline's death and eight years after this incident, a member of the New Jersey Assembly, Mrs. Constant Hand, she gave a speech at an event honoring the state Senator Clay, it was 500 women there. And she referred to this incident and she said that this incident was a personal affront to the womanhood of the state of New Jersey. So clearly years later, they were still feeling the sting of this and this was something very much resented. But I think the reason why this incident left such a big impression is because I think Carolyn was very effective in her various positions. Um, she moves now, she moves on to, you know, she works for Hoboken, she works for New Jersey, she works for America, she moves on to the international and the national stage. Um, she was, uh, she, her effectiveness on issues of social welfare was noted by Governor Wilson in 1910. He appointed Caroline as the US representative to the International Congress of Family Education in Brussels, Belgium. In 1911, at the start of Governor Wilson's term, his wife Edith was honorary director of the State Charities Aid Association and she reached out to Carolyn for guidance. In a biography of Edith Wilton, Wilson, Carolyn is characterized as a dynamic reformer who was considered the, quote, guardian of Hudson County for all her charitable activities. Um, at this point, Carolyn really does have a lot of expertise. She's been working most of her life on social work and also prison reform. That was probably one of the biggest areas of her life that she spent a lot of time on. Um, her expertise on prison reform led her to be appointed by President Hoover in 1929 to the International Prison Commission. And upon her return, from the 1930 conference that was held in Prague, she noted to reporters that while European prisons were showing a decrease in the number of prisoners, American prisons were showing a big increase. She also spoke on European opposition to capital punishment and solitary confinement. The more things change. In July of 1931, oh, here's, I just want to show you this picture, Caroline. This is her on the Stevens campus in 1927. Again, we don't have a lot of pictures of her there. She is in front, she's with President Humphreys. Um, okay, in July of 1931, Otto Whitpen became suddenly and seriously ill with blood poisoning. And I put this slide together to give you an idea of what an important person he was at the time. Um, there was a death watch. I mean, these are just some of them. There was something in there every day. The one on the upper left here, Whitpin doing well, I think that's from the New York Times. There were a couple in the Times too. So this went on, he was sick for about a month and every day there would be another report on him. He's rallying, he's had a bad night, looks good, looks bad. And it's very sad. They've been married now for 15 years, Caroline and Otto. And it's sad and I'm don't want to get mushy, but I think they really, this was a real love match. By the way, he was 11 years younger than her. Um, he did not have any children. She did not have any children with him. Um, I think they were probably a devoted couple who were really in love, and this is really sad. Um, at this point, at the point of Otto's death, Carolyn is 73 years old. Um, she's still working, but she's still holding her uh, positions on the State Board of Institution and Agencies. And in that capacity, here's this slide, um, in that capacity, she is appointed to head up a task force on ways to encourage employers to hire more women. Um, this is the depression now. Um, 
on December 4th, 1932, just about two weeks after she celebrates her birthday with a dinner in her honor at the Waldheim Forum here in Hoboken. Um, she dies at Stevens Castle. Her funeral was held at uh, Holy Innocence and attended by 400 family, friends, and dignitaries. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I think is interesting on these uh, headlines, uh, this, the one here on the left is from the New York Times, the one on the right is from the Jersey Journal. And it's interesting that the one on the right says following family custom to be buried in wicker basket. I never knew that. Who knew that that was a family custom among the Stevens? Um, and I'm gonna show you this. This is all we have in her hand. It's, there's, it's, 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 no, yeah. This is, this is not adding anything to our story. It doesn't illuminate anything, but it is in her hand. It's a note card from her, uh, Mrs. H. Otto Whitpin. This was probably sent to one of the Miller sisters, we think, who lived on Bloomfield Street. It says, will you come here, meaning, I, I'm assuming meaning Stevens Castle, will you come here after the forum lecture on March 1st to meet Baroness von Hindenburg. Um, in case you're wondering, Baroness von Hindenburg was considered one of the most beautiful women in the world at the time. Um, so yippee. Um, now I'm gonna go back one slide. Um, our story doesn't end there because people are complicated. Um, about a year after Carolyn died, there was a newspaper report on her will. She had made a change to it in July of 1932, so six years before she died, she made a change to her will. Um, and I wanna read the change to you. And I just want you to keep in mind that this is the depression. And this is the change that she made to her will. Realizing that prevalent business conditions have reduced my income, as well as the real property and the securities I own, and not desiring in any way to cause embarrassment to my grandson, I hereby revoke each and every device and bequest in said will except those two, four, and in any way affecting my said grandson. Among the bequests to charity in the original will were 10,000 to St. Paul School and the United Aid Society of Hoboken and Christ Hospital of Hoboken, 10,000 to be divided between the Mary Stevens Hammond home and the St. Bernard's Parish of Bernardsville and $5,000 to Holy Innocence Church. Um, so what Carolyn is saying here is that she's leaving it to her, son, her grandson's um, discretion whether he's going to honor these bequests or not. So I just wanna say, like I said, people are complicated. This is the depression. I also wanna point out that Carolyn's brothers all were educated and they all, most of them got jobs. They worked as lawyers or investment people and they got paid for those jobs. Carolyn worked her whole life and she never got paid. So here she's nearing the end of her life and she's thinking, I need to take care of my, my... she had a grandson, that's all she had. Otto was gone, her brothers and sisters are gone. Her son is dead. So I think that she was thinking about that. Um, I just want to leave you the last thing on Carolyn. I'm just going to read you a quote from the Jersey Journal on 1905. They did a big article on um, the philanthropic ladies of Hudson County, of which Martha and Caroline were at the top. And this is the way they talk about Caroline. Her work is felt not only in Hoboken, but also Hudson City. Her work for the good of Hoboken is so well known as to need no effort at recollection. Connected with all these charitable movements, her efforts are not confined to the city alone, but associated with her brother, Richard Stevens. She serves the city without salary in the capacity of assistant probation officer, taking charge of the women and girls who come under the care of the office. She attends every session of court, this gentle faced woman of broad sympathies and general impulses with a frank smile and an unaffected simplicity of manner. I wanna point out that next Saturday is Carolyn Whitpin's 161st birthday. That's all I got.
So that is, if anybody has any questions, I'll hope I can answer them. I really don't know, but we can give it a try. Well, we'd like to uh, mention that um, Susan Powers Lord Lodge and George Lodge and they their Caroline's great great grandchildren. Oh, okay. Well, let's put up uh, our slide. Uh, all right. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I was hoping someone was going to ask about Caroline's descendants. Um, this is, to my knowledge, the last Archibald Stevens Alexander. He died in 2016. This is just a part of his um, obit. This guy sounds like he was a great guy. Um, and it does mention here. Uh, Archie is survived by his wife, Nina, his children, Benjamin Alexander, Jocelyn Alexander, Christopher Alexander, two granddaughters, Anna and Reeve Alexander, Helen Provost, Susan Lodge of Beverly, Massachusetts. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm, I'm honored. And if I made any mistakes, please let me know. Um, and many nieces and nephews. So I am so glad somebody said that because I had this slide ready to go for that. Yeah, that was uh, Sam. Sam Reckford sent in a private message and, and mentioned that. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. Um, and the Reckfords are also um, their Millicent Fenwick's grandsons, I think, pretty yep. sure. Um, so that's that's really nice. Um, OK, so if there's no questions um, and there's no questions online. Hang on, let's let me check one more time. But I think Carolyn was a really cool woman. I'm really glad that I included her. And I think that she needs to be remembered more in our community because she did a lot. No, it's good. We're done. It's good. Okay. Yeah, you, All right, everybody. Thank you. So oh, wait, I want to say one thing. Please come back next week um, and um, for our talk on Ann Ryan. It's going to be really, really good. Linda, did you have a question? Oh, you're um, going to. Just wanted to thank you for all that research. Oh. I think most people are. You know, they know Martha Bayard, but more in association with her husband uh, and not too deep on Martha, but Carolyn, you know, it's, cool it's this cool is all chick, new right? to, I'd say, 99% of the audience, except for the relatives who are. Uh, um, Carolyn, who are Carolyn on. Stevens was the woke Stevens. Yeah, she definitely. Was, she was happening. Sure. Okay. So oh, wait, I, oh. Sam, Sam says he has something to say about the missing. Archibald. Oh, the missing husband? Yeah. yeah. So let, 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 let's see if I can bring him in here. Let's figure this out. When, oh, from when, the horse's when, mouth. Oh, we get the family gossip. Yeah, in, in the family memoirs, there is a story oh, about- Hang, hang on a sec, Sam. I'm, okay. I'm trying to just see if I can get the people in the, in the room to see you too. Um, it's going to be Does it need a to... minor, minor challenge. Just give me another sec. Uh, no. So Linda's going to make a comment as we're waiting for Okay. Sam. Uh, Sam. You, you just you just said that um, Carolyn was a woke chick, but I feel like the majority of that family was was woke. They, were they very did they did an enormous amount of philanthropy in this town. They were they, very progressive. They established you know, so much for this community, really. So you know that's why I'm surprised that there aren't more. There had to have been a lot of photographs at one point because let's face it, all these guys were like engineers and then you had a camera come out come on they had to be going out there going i got to get me one of these newfangled uh, machines um but we really there's really not that many photographs of steven's people uh, i'm unfortunately i, I okay. can't figure out how to get it yeah no i room. think it's complicated but sam go ahead and, and you can oh, yeah, share it, it with the people uh, who are on zoom sure so in in one of the family memoirs and i don't have a footnote immediately handy as to which one uh, there is a story that one night in 1906, in Archibald in Alexander um, was horsewhipped and run out of town by the Stevens, by Carolyn's brothers, after he was caught exiting the window of the gatehouse from the bedroom of a visiting Stockton cousin, who had been quite quite taken by his charms. So he was he was driven out of town. <laughs> this is Archibald Alexander. Why? I kind of thought he was gay. What what did he say was the reason? Yeah. It was, he, just, he was uh, coming out of the bedroom of a of one of the Stockton cousins. A, a male or a female Stockton? I uh, honestly, it doesn't say here. <laughs> My <laughs> assumption has always been female, but I, I have no idea. <laughs> hmm. 
but that is uh, that's that comes from somebody's memoirs. Hey, that's All not right. nearly as it might be Mary Barrett. As but... interesting as I thought it was going to be. That's great, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> and by the way, uh, Martha was a Stockton. So you talked Mar about her sisters marrying Stockton. Martha they were was marrying, a Stockton. They were marrying their cousins, but her great grandparents were Stocktons. Got it. Oh. Okay, interesting. Cool. So Martha was a Stockton. She was related to the Stockton. Absolutely family. was. Um, and, and the Bayards. And the Bayards. So she came from an illustrious family, sort of like, you know, but cash poor. Yeah, like, and I'll add one more comment. Her grandfather was a uh, steam engine uh, pioneer. And <laughs> so I've often wondered if somehow there's a connection there. And in fact, he was, he died. He was um, a steam um, uh, engine that he was working on exploded and killed him. And uh, so he died quite early as his, as the son did. But I've sort of wondered if somehow the steam connection was what might have brought the two families together. Also, they were his, his father, her father was a theologian and the Stevens were very pious, very religious. Thank you so much, Sam. Happy to add something. Okay, everybody, thank you so thank much you for joining us, our big crowd here in the museum, and uh, thanks a lot.